I'm Brett Winton, Chief Futurist at ARK Invest, uh, responsible for running our top-down technology forecasts, cost declines, and expectations for growth across all of the disruptive technologies we cover. Today, I'm going to talk about precision therapies. Uh, precision therapies are new ways that we can treat diseases. We can manipulate DNA directly, RNA, manipulate the proteome, uh, and they're also increasingly offering cures, particularly for rare diseases. This changes the economics of drug development, and we think over the course of this decade, it's going to radically transform the way we think about disease and the tools that we have available to treat diseases. In aggregate, we think there's roughly $800 billion in market cap attributable to precision therapies today, and our research indicates that that's going to expand to roughly four and a half trillion dollars in market cap by the end of this decade. Uh, so why is this happening? As you can see on this graph, the number of tools that um, researchers and, and translational medicine companies have at their disposal to treat diseases has expanded uh, massively just over the course of the past decade. Each purple dot on this graph indicates a new type of kind of drug modality. Uh, that can be used to try to treat diseases. And as you can see, the concentration of purple dots in the 2010s and 2020s uh, is a new set of tools that uh, companies are using to try to address um, disease. And it's a good thing we have all of these new tools. Actually, so 25% of clinical trials um, in, uh, in trial today are uh, these precision therapies, these new tools that we have available to us. And it's a good thing we have these new tools because uh, over the course of the last you know, 25 years almost, the returns to R&D for drug developers have been decaying. Uh, if, as you can see on this chart, the number of R&D dollars thrown into dr drug development up until the year 2000 um, translated into kind of an incremental boost in revenue uh, roughly equal to the amount of R&D dollars put in. Uh, and then after 2000, that ratio has been decaying. So companies have had to spend more and more on R&D to deliver uh, less and less in terms of incremental revenue yield. Put another way, return on R&D has been falling. Uh, and um, as you can see in the last data point, that's turned around a little bit, um, what with uh, COVID and, and the returns on COVID vaccines. Um, but the long-term trend has really been pretty dire. Uh, and we believe that um, it's going to structurally change over the course of this decade as these companies are able to command new pricing for uh, curative therapies and uh, deliver more efficacious treatment with all of the new modalities they have available to them. Uh, and so um, really we think by 2030, the, the industry as a whole will look more like it did in the early 2000s than over the last um, five years of, of really pretty paltry return on R&D. So how is this happening? Well, the new modalities we have available to us actually expand the number of diseases that we can treat. On the left, you can see there are roughly 20,000 proteins in the body, and you can think of a disease as something that's gone wrong with a protein. So you, a very crude way to think about the body is, hey, I have 20,000 proteins, each one could have something wrong with it, and so there's like 20,000 diseases. It's not quite that simple, but that's a way to think about it. Uh, and right now, of those 20,000 um, um, protein, or really protein coding genes, uh, uh, only 4% are have FDA approved therapies. Uh, and so only 4% of the potential uh, kind of genes that we could treat, we currently have drugs for. Uh, with um, targeted protein degraders, which is an example of one of these new uh, modalities that are available, more than half of proteins could be addressable um, by, by drugs. Uh, and so it really expands the number of potential diseases that we could even figure out medicines for uh, in an in, in order of magnitude way. Uh, the other interesting um, characteristic of precision therapies is because they're precise, um, actually the competitive landscape is um, a little friendlier if you're de uh, developing a precision therapy. So on the right, 
on a conventional therapy in purple, uh, if you're going after a specific target, there are an average two and a half other drugs, roughly, that are going after that same target. Uh, and so even if you get to market, you have to be better than those two and a half other drugs when you get to market and or you have to get to market ahead of them. Uh, in the precision therapy space, um, there's less than one other competitor on average going after each you know, particular target that um, they're developing drugs for. So this just means that the competitive intensity uh, is lower for companies developing precision therapies. Uh, and, and so you're more likely to get uh, a good return on bringing a therapy to market. Uh, now let's cover and think about, I've talked kind of abstractly about how these therapies are gonna address diseases. Let's focus on a specific disease where there's now, you know, what seems to effectively be a cure in market and talk about the value of that cure. This disease is sickle cell disease. So sickle cell anemia um, is really a, a terrible disease to have. People who have it have chronic pain. Uh, they live to an average age of around 50 years. Uh, so they have a significantly shortened lifespan. They often have to go to the hospital, you know, sometimes multiple times a year um, to deal with um, kind of acute episodes. Uh, and um, there are companies that have brought gene editing therapies to market um, that uh, seem to cure this disease. So what is that worth? If you can take this um, rare, but um, very, very um, impactful disease and deliver a cure. Well, if you look at a typical sickle cell patient over the course of the you know, 50 plus years of life that they'll live, they accrue almost $2 million in medical costs, much of which it doesn't go to medicine. Uh, it goes to those hospital visits, the transfusions they need to get. Uh, and, and so it's both very harmful to the person that has it and very costly to the healthcare system as a whole. Uh, that's on the left. If you look on the right, uh, if, you take, if you adjust for the time value of that money spent, the present value of the cost of managing that condition is around a million dollars. Meaning, even taking into account the time value of money, if I spent a million dollars for a cure for that disease, I would, it would be economically neutral relative to all of the bills I'd have to pay out over the course of the patient's life. If you further adjust for how you're extending that patient's life and increasing the quality of that patient's life, you end up with um, a total value for a cure for sickle cell disease in excess of $2 million. And so um, the system as a whole should say, this is great, we're willing to pay $2 million plus for this treatment, because we deliver a one-time cure and we avoid you know, almost $2 million in costs that we were other going, otherwise going to accrue, and uh, we extend the patient's life and provide them uh, you know, with, with a much better, much better set of outcomes. Uh, and so that's not true just for sickle cell disease. We think we're gonna, you're going to begin to see many rare diseases submit to effective cures, whereas before you had to treat them kind of as chronic conditions where you were managing symptoms rather than delivering a true beneficial patient outcome. Uh, and so if you look across all rare diseases, um, that actually you know, ends up in an, an extraordinarily large potential market. If, if we could deliver a cure for all rare diseases you know, over the course of patient lives, we could save on the order of uh, $20 trillion if you adjust for the time value of money uh, and kind of the quality of life year gain that you'll get, we would uh, conclude that a cures for all rare diseases could command $15 trillion in, uh, in spent. Uh, and so um, this, this is both a very large number. It also has meaningful commercial impact for the companies that are delivering these cures. If you think about it, the, the um, idea of charging a patient every year uh, for having a, a disease is in some ways attractive. You, you uh, get to sell them medicine every year, um, but then you're subject to all of the competition that happens with patent cliffs and um, other potential um, treatments entering the market. Whereas if you can cure the patient population, you can upfront all of those payments and actually avoid some of that competitive intensity down the road. Uh, so we think it'll be really interesting to see how this like flows through to companies' financial results that are delivering these cures. Uh, 
If you look across all precision therapies, um, we think that there are a number of categories that are interesting, uh, including kind of cell therapies, gene editing, um, therapies that address your RNA, which is one layer above uh, DNA, uh, and, um, and even precision small molecules like targeted protein degraders. And in aggregate, by 2030, we think four and a half trillion dollars in value will accrue to these precision therapy companies. Um, so we think it's going to be you know, a remarkable decade in healthcare uh, that many uh, diseases that were previously poorly understood and even if well understood didn't have um, kind of effective or attractive um, medical uh, or, or medicinal options to, to deal with them are going to um, be cracked with um, cures and, and radically transformative treatments that will both be broadly beneficial for the people that have the disease and commercially beneficial for the companies that deliver those cures.